Sayın hocalarım, değerli katılımcılar, Veteriner Hekimlik'te Yapay Zeka ve Dijitalizasyon başlıklı eğitim programımıza hoş geldiniz. Dijitalleşmenin gereği olarak bilgi teknolojilerinin hızla ilerlediği günümüzde güncel teknik, bilgi ve becerilerin yanında idrak etme, bilişsel ve yaratıcı düşünme, problem çözebilme gibi becerilerle donatılmış mezunlara ihtiyaç olduğu bilinmektedir. Çok hızlı ilerleyen nesnelerin interneti, yapay zeka gibi yeni teknolojiler ile birlikte insanların yaşama ve çalışma biçimleri değişmekte, gelişmekte ve hayatımızın her alanında olduğu gibi mesleğimiz olan veteriner hekimlerine de yön vermekte. Yeni iş modelleri, iş tanımları, iş yapma şekilleri, süreçleri, finansman modelleri, çalışma yerleri gibi farklı alanları gündeme getirmektedir. Veteriner Hekimlik'te dijital teknolojilerin kullanımına ilişkin Avrupa Veteriner Eğitimi Koordinasyon Komitesi (ICTVT) tarafından düzenlenen çalıştayın raporları ve EAV'nin bizlere yönlendirmiş olduğu bilgilendirme mesajında özellikle belirtilen eğitim programlarımızın güncellenmesi, yeni seçmeli derslerin açılması, dış paylaşlarla multidisipliner çalışmaların başlatılabilmesi hususlarını dikkate alarak fakülte olarak çalışmalarımıza başladık. Bu kapsamda yapılan çalışmalarımız hakkında az sonra Sayın Dekanımız Profesör Doktor Ender Yersan tarafından bilgi verilecektir. Programımıza kayıtlı 176 katılımcımız bulunmaktadır. Bu katılımcılar farklı üniversite, kurum ve kuruluşlardan olan hem deneyimli hem de genç meslektaşlarımızdan oluşmaktadır. Katılımcı sayısının bu denli yüksek olması memnuniyet vericidir ve ileride sadece konu ve tür temelli daha farklı programların oluşturabileceği konusunda bizleri teşvik etmektedir. Eğitim programımızı EAV raporunda belirtilen hususları kapsayacak şekilde ve çoğunluğu dış paydaşlarımızın katkılarıyla oluşturduk. Sizlerden gelecek geri bildirimlerle farklı hayvan türlerini kapsayacak ya da özelleşmiş uygulamaları kapsayacak yeni eğitim programları yapmayı planlıyoruz. Ücretsiz eğitimimizin süresi toplam 20 saattir. Etkinlik sonunda katılım belgesinin alınabilmesi için kayıt formunun doldurulması, Etkinlik kapsamında verilecek tüm derslerin %70'ine katılım sağlanması, değerlendirme sınavına girilmesi ve geri bildirim yapılması şartı bulunmaktadır. Bugünkü açılış dersi devam kapsamında değerlendirilmemektedir. Lisans öğrencileri bu eğitim kapsamında fakültede aynı saatte olan derslerinden muaf sayılmayacaktır. Eğitim birinci ve ikinci sınıf lisans öğrencileri için temel veteriner hekimlik kavramlarını tamamlamamaları nedeniyle tavsiye edilmemektedir. Öğrencilerimizin bu bilinçle katılımları önemli rica olunur. Programımıza destek veren tüm eğitmenlerimize, programın gerçekleşmesini sağlayan Sayın <gülüyor> Yarsan'a ve kayıt aşamasında yardımcı olan araştırma görevlisi Durmuş Atılgan'a teşekkür etmek istiyorum. İlgi ve katılımınız için şimdiden tüm katılımcılara teşekkür ediyor ve sözü Sayın Profesör Yarsan'a bırakıyorum. Buyurun hocam. Peki hocam çok teşekkür ediyorum. Tabii bizim açımızdan son derece önemli bir program. Başlattığımız bir süreç yakın zaman içerisinde. Bu süreci anlatırken, ifade ederken ben biraz da görsel materyallerden yararlanmak da isterim. Biraz 2020 yılı içerisinde hazırlanmış olan bir rapor vardı. Dolayısıyla o rapora da atıf yapacak şekilde küçük bir sunu hazırladım. O sunu kapsamında görüşlerimizi en azından açılış konuşması kapsamında sizlerle paylaşayım. Eğer biraz önce de ifade ettim, sunuyu paylaşım sırasında bir sıkıntı olursa da yine benimle haber verirseniz onu yeniden sisteme yüklemiş olalım. Şu şekliyle başlatıyorum. Begüm Hocam görülüyor herhalde değil mi şu anda? Görülüyor hocam. Tamam. Evet değerli katılımcılar, ben de Ankara Üniversitesi Veteriner Fakültesi olarak Gerçekten böylesine önemli bir konuya katkı sağladığınız, katılım sağladığınız için hepinize teşekkür ediyorum ve hepinize hoş geldiniz diyorum. Biraz önce Begüm Hoca bizim mesleğimiz açısından gerek eğitim noktasında gerekse uygulamalar noktasında dijital teknolojinin ve sanal zekanın olmazsa olmaz olduğunu ve son dönem itibariyle de özellikle EAV kapsamında buna ilişkin yaklaşımların önemsendiğini Dolayısıyla bizlerin de buna uygun olacak şekilde bir takım çalışmaları yapmamız gerektiğini ifade etti. Dolayısıyla bundan hareketle bu eğitim programını sizler için hazırladık. Buna şöyle genel bir değerlendirme yapacak olursak, tabii Avrupa Veteriner Eğitim Koordinasyon Komitesi tarafından veteriner hekimlikte dijital teknolojilerin kullanımına ilişkin bir çalıştay düzenlenmiş. Mayıs 2018 yılı itibariyle de bu çalıştayın sonuçları kamuyla paylaşılmış. 
Ancak o zamana gelene kadar da özellikle 2017 yılı içerisinde çok kapsamlı çalışmalar sürdürülmüş ve bu çalışmalar neticesinde ortaya çıkan görüşler de 2018 yılı raporu içerisine aksettirilmiş durumda. Ve oluşturulan bir çalışma grubu vasıtasıyla da veteriner hekimlik eğitiminde ve aynı şekilde veteriner hekimliği uygulamalarında dijital teknolojilerin ve yapay zekanın kullanımı, fırsat, risk ve genel etkilerinin değerlendiren bir rapor hazırlanmış bu grup tarafından. Hazırlanan bu, bu raporda başlıklar halinde ifade edecek olursak, hayvan hastalıkları ve zoonoz hastalıkların önlenmesi, teşhisi ve tedavisinin geliştirilmesi noktasında yaklaşımlar, genom, ekspozom ve mikrobiyomun hayvan sağlığı, refahı ve üretimi, halk sağlığı ve tek sağlık konsepti üzerindeki etkisinin araştırılması noktasındaki yaklaşımlar, sürü sağlığı yönetimi, e, bunun güncel olarak kapsamlı şekilde değerlendirilmesi, teknolojiyle birleştirilmesi, aynı şekilde teknoloji tabanlı önleme, teşhis ve tedavi protokolleri aracılığıyla gereksiz ilaç, ki özellikle bu noktada antibiyotikler son derece önemli, gereksiz ilaç kullanımının azaltılması, farmakovijilans raporlamasının iyileştirilmesi, bir ilaç piyasaya sunulduktan sonra özellikle bu ilaçla ilgili advers etkilerin, geri bildirimlerin farmakovijilans kapsamında değerlendirilmesi gerekir. Son dönemde ortaya çıkan önemli yaklaşımlardan bir tanesidir. Yine bunun da raporlaması noktasındaki bu yaklaşımlar son derece önemli. Yeni koruyucu hekimlik stratejilerinin hayvana özgü, etkene özgü ilaçların ve aşıların geliştirilmesi, hayvan sağlığı, halk sağlığı ve çevre sağlığı ile ilgili paydaşlarla sektörler arası ve disiplinler arası işbirliğinin geliştirilmesi bu raporda ana başlıklar halinde yer alan yaklaşımlar olmuştur. Tabi 2017 yılı itibariyle başlayan süreç 2018'de çalışma grubu oluşturulmuş ve bir rapor haline getirilmiş. Ancak süreç noktalanmamış. 2018 yılından itibaren bu biraz önce belirlenen başlıklar halinde 2018 yılı raporu Mayıs raporu esas alınarak 2020 yılı itibariyle de yine bir çalışma grubu oluşturulmuş, uzmanlar grubu oluşturulmuş ve uzmanlar grubu tarafından 2020 yılı için yine bir döküman hazırlanmıştır ve bu döküman içerisinde dijital teknolojilerin ve yapay zekanın veteriner hekimliği yönüyle fırsatları, riskleri ve genel etkisini değerlendirecek şekilde altı tematik alan belirlenmiştir başlıklar halinde. Hocam, ve aynı şekilde Kusura bakmayın, bölüyorum ama slaytlarınızı görebilmemiz için tekrardan bir e, ekran paylaşımı yapabilir misiniz acaba? Şu anda e, ekranımızda slaytlar henüz ilerlemiyor. Tekrar bir daha yapayım Begüm Hocam. Evet, teşekkür ederiz. Sağ olun hocam. Şunu bakın, paylaşımı durdurdum. Şu anda görünen noktada mı? Evet, görünen noktada. Tamam. Teşekkür ederim. Biraz önce söylediğim 2020 yılı raporunda özellikle 6 tane tematik alan belirlenmiş ve buna ilişkin de gelecek stratejileri de yine aynı şekilde ortaya konmuştur. Tabii bu noktadan itibaren üye ülkelerle ilgili de üye ülkelerin neler yapması gerektiği ile ilgili yaklaşımlar da yine aynı şekilde bu rapor içerisinde ifade edilmiştir. Altı tematik alan diye söyledim. Bu altı tematik alan nedir? Bunlardan ilki veteriner hekimliği eğitiminde ve uygulamalarında bu teknolojinin kullanımına, dijital teknoloji ya da sanal zekanın kullanımına ilişkin bir SWOT analizinin hazırlanması. Güçlü yönlerimiz nedir? Zayıf yönlerimiz nedir? Fırsatlar ya da tehditler neler olabilir bu sistemle ilgili veteriner hekimliği noktasında? Buna ilişkin değerlendirmenin yapılması istenmiştir. Bu kapsamda alt başlıklar olarak da literatür ve mevcut bilgilerin gözden geçirilmesi, Veteriner hekimliği eğitiminde ya da veteriner hekimliği uygulamalarında bu teknolojinin kullanımının etkisinin değerlendirilmesi istenmiş ve aynı şekilde yine üye ülkelere yönelik olacak şekilde ve bu teknolojiyle ilgili bir SWOT analizinin yapılması beklenmiştir. Nedir bu SWOT analizi dediğimiz zaman da başlıklar halinde şimdi mesleğimiz açısından eğer bu teknoloji uygulanırsa güçlü olduğumuz yönler var. Nelerdir? Etkili ve sürdürülebilir veteriner hekimliği eğitimi ve uygulamasını Geliştirme isteği. Bu gerçekten hem e, akademisyenler olarak bizde hem de aynı şekilde uygulama noktasında meslektaşlarımızda olan bir süreçtir, olan bir istektir. Bunun güçlü bir şekilde ortaya çıkmış olması bizim güçlü yönümüz olarak ifade edilmiştir. Özellikle öğrenciler ve genç mezunlar arasında bu anlamdaki araçları kullanma becerisinin yüksek olması, 
E, bu tabi e, özellikle genç meslektaşlarımız yönüyle bu teknolojiler son derece aşina oldukları teknolojiler. Bunu kullanma noktasındaki yatkınlık önemli. Çoğu akademisyen, öğrenci, uygulayıcı ve hasta sahipleri için bilgisayarların ve akıllı telefonların mevcudiyeti bu da güçlü yönümüz olarak ifade edilmiş ve aynı şekilde Avrupa'da uyumlaştırılmış bir veteriner hekimli eğitiminin olması da yine bu sistemin kullanılması noktasında güçlü yönlerimiz olarak ifade edilmiş. SWOT analizi içerisindeki zayıf yönlerimizde özellikle bu teknolojinin fırsatları ve tehditleri hakkında akademisyen ve uygulayıcıların aslında genel anlamda bir istekten bahsedilir ama yetersiz bilgisi ya da isteksizliği bir zayıf yön olarak ifade edilmiştir. Disiplinler arası yetersiz işbirliği, yeterli işbirliğinin olmaması bir zayıf yöndür. Hali hazırda bağımsız olarak doğrulanmış, resmi olarak yetkilendirilmiş eğitim ve uygulama için tamamen mevcut olan araç ve uygulama sayısının yetersizliği, aynı şekilde verimli, güvenli ve yasal kullanımına ilişkin az sayıda az sayıdaki bir mevzuat, politika ve aynı şekilde bunun önemli bir boyutudur. Etik ve deontolojik düzenlemelerin de şu an için zayıf olması, yetersiz olması, algoritmaları test etmek için doğru ve uyumlu verilerin yetersizliği, uzaktan eğitim yoluyla sosyal becerileri geliştirme zorluğu da aynı şekilde bu sistemle ilgili zayıf yönlerimiz olarak mesleki anlamda ifade edilmiştir. Peki bunları eğer biz ortaya koyarsak fırsatlarımız neler olabilir? Birçok disiplinde veteriner hekimliği eğitimi ve uygulamasının kalitesinin iyileştirilmesi bir fırsat olarak karşımıza çıkar. Öğrenciler ve diğer paydaşlarla iletişimin geliştirilmesi, daha kişiselleştirilmiş eğitim, hayvan sağlığı refahı, 3R kavramını da iyi uygulama, 3R kavramının da daha iyi uygulaması. Hocam kusura bakmayın tekrardan e, ekranımızda ilerleme ile alakalı sıkıntımız var. Onu e, tekrar hatırlatayım istedim. Ben e, geriye gittiğim zaman şu an görünüyorum. Şey... Slide'dayız. Ee, arada çıkıp bir şey yapıp bir bir şey yapabilirsiniz ya da e, tam ekrana çevirirseniz belki hani bu şey e, kaybolacaktır. Şu anda görünüyor mu ürünü? Şu anda ekran paylaşımı? Henüz başlamadı. Tekrar yapıyorum ekran paylaşımını. Yani bu aslında şu anda görünüyor herhalde yine. Evet. Tamam. Tamam. Zayıf yönlerimiz olarak ifade ettim. Fırsatlarımız olarak da yine bunları biraz önce söylediğim gibi ifade ettim. Hayvan sağlığı, refahı ve üretiminin iyileştirilmesi, verimli, uyumlu ve uygun maliyetli e-öğrenme için araçların paylaşılması, büyük veri analizlerinin hayvan, insan ve çevre yararına daha iyi kullanılması. Bunlar da bu sistemin fırsatları olarak ifade edilebilir. Aynı şekilde tehditler noktasında da yine önemlidir. Bu sisteme aşırı güvenilmesi bir tehdit olarak değerlendirilir. Uygulamalı eğitimin yerine dijital teknolojilerin geçmesi yine aynı şekilde bir tehdit olarak ifade edilir. Etik dışı yaklaşımların olması, yetersiz bilgi ve verilerin kötüye kullanılması yine aynı şekilde bir tehdit olarak ifade edilir. Zayıf internet bağlantısı gibi bu uygulamalara, araçlara erişememe durumu da yine tehdit olarak ifade edilmektedir. SWOT analizi haricinde tematik alanlar noktasında ikinci başlığı da bu teknolojinin iyi anlaşılmasını ve sorumlu kullanımını sağlamak için ilk gün yeterlilikleri noktasında bir takım kazanımlar elde edebiliriz. Örneğin temel bilgilerin bu noktada veteriner hekimliği eğitim öğretimi sırasında alınması, kavramsal bilgi ve bu terminolojinin anlaşılması, uygulamaların, araçların nasıl oluşturulduğu, işlendiği ve potansiyel olarak veteriner hekimliğin tüm yönleri için nasıl kullanıldığına dair kavramsal bir anlayış, dijital uygulamalar ve araçlarla pratik eğitim, gibi yaklaşımlar da yine bu sistem içerisinde ilk gün yeterlilikleri noktasındaki kazanımlar noktasında ifade edilir. Yine geliştirilebilecek yeterlilikler hakkında tavsiyelerde bulunmak üçüncü bir tematik alan olarak ifade edilmiştir. İzleme ve kayıt analizlerinin yapılması, biyolojik veri analizlerinin gerçekleştirilmesi gibi, görüntü, video ya da ses analizlerinin yapılması da bu alt başlığın, tematik alanın farklı uygulamaları noktasında karşımıza çıkan yaklaşımlardır. Yine aynı şekilde veteriner hekimler muayenehanelerinde, hastanelerinde mesleklerini icra ederken iletişim şekilleri konusunda da önerilerde bulunabilir bu sistem. E-posta, sosyal ağlar, mesajlaşma uygulamaları, web siteleri, müşterilerle iletişim için sohbet robotlarının oluşturulması, cep telefonu uygulamaları, uzaktan izleme sensörleri, hasta davranışı analizleri gibi yaklaşımlar da yine aynı şekilde dördüncü tematik alt başlık olarak ifade edilmiştir. 
sadece veteriner hekimliği uygulamalarında değil, sadece lisans uygulamasında, lisans eğitiminde değil, aynı zamanda lisans üstü eğitim öğretiminde de yine dijital teknolojilerin kullanılması son derece önemli bir yaklaşım olarak karşımıza çıkar. Bu da beşinci tematik alan olarak değerlendirilmiştir. Yine altıncı tematik alan olarak da dijital teknolojileriyle bağlantılı kalite güvencesi hakkında tavsiyelerde bulunmak. Tabii kalite güvencesi de bugün için gerek vedek, gerekse EAV akreditasyonu noktasında bizim açımızdan son derece önemli bir yaklaşım. Dolayısıyla kalite güvencesi ile ilgili yaklaşımlarda da dijital teknolojilerle ilgili bir alt başlık, bir tematik başlık olarak seçilmiştir. Bu uygulamalardan yararlanmak son derece önemli kabul edilmiştir. Tabii biraz önce Begüm Hoca söyledi fakültemizin yaklaşımlarının da bu anlamda ifade edilmesi gerekir diye. Biz açıkçası konuyu son derece önemli bulduk. Ve önemli bulduğumuz bu konuyla ilgili de neler yapabiliriz? İşte buna ilişkin düzenlemeleri de Veteriner Fakültesi dekanlığı olarak ortaya koyduk. 15 Aralık 2020 tarihinde Veteriner Hekimliği eğitiminde dijital teknoloji ve yapay zeka uygulamaları başlıklı bir webinar hazırladık. Akademi, özel sektör, kamu, sivil toplum kuruluşları ve ilgili paydaşların hepsinin bir araya getirildiği yaklaşık 120 kişilik katılımla bir etkinliği webinarı gerçekleştirdik ve webinar kaydımızı da fakültemizin YouTube sayfasında tüm izleyicilerle paylaşacak hale getirdik. Bu konuda bir çalışma grubunu oluşturduk fakültemizde. Bu çalışma grubu aracılığında bu etkinliklerin paylaşılmasını sağladık. Aynı şekilde buna ilişkin bir yönergeyi fakültemizde hazırladık. Yine önemliydi bu türden etkinliklerin paylaşılması noktasında uzaktan eğitim fakültesi ile ilgili ile birlikte ortak bir protokol oluşturuldu. Çünkü bu eğitim programlarında kayıtlı öğrencilerin tespit edilmesi, değerlendirilmesi aynı şekilde buna ilişkin kayıtların e, oluşturulması noktasında uzaktan eğitim fakültesinin yaklaşımı önemliydi. Bir protokol oluşturarak imza altına aldım. Yine bu meslektaşlarımıza yönelik özellikle uygulama noktasında bu sistemle ilgili bilgilerin paylaşılması noktasında Türk Veteriner Hekimleri Birliği ile ortak bir protokol hazırladık. Geçen hafta içerisinde 19 Şubat itibariyle bu protokolü de yine Sayın Başkan'la imza altına aldık. Bu bizim için önemliydi. Dolayısıyla bu önemine binaen de bir seçmeli dersin oluşturulması noktasında bir yaklaşım da yine söz konusu oldu. Buraya almadım ama seçmeli dersinde oluşturulmasıyla ilgili Özellikle çalışma grubu içerisinde böyle bir değerlendirme yapıldı ve muhtemelen bu dönem olmazsa bile ilerleyen dönemler içerisinde bir seçme, seçmeli ders fakültemizin müfredatı içerisinde oluşturularak hayata geç, geçirilecek. Ve tabii işte bugün için başlattığımız eğitim programı bizim açımızdan son derece önemliydi. Önemli bir programdı eğitim programı ve bu programın da gerçekleştirilmesi söz konusu oldu. 22 Şubat itibariyle bugün başlayacak ve 2 Nisan 2021'de tamamlanacak ve bu şekliyle 6 haftalık bir program şeklinde planlandı eğitim programımız. Programa ben burada 160 katılımcı dedim ama bu katılımcı sayısı hızla arttı ve biraz önce Begüm Hoca'nın bahsettiği şekilde sayı 176 olarak ifade edildi. Tarım Orman Bakanlığı, üniversiteler, özel şirketlerden olacak şekilde de konunun uzmanı 18 kişi bu eğitim programı içerisinde sunu yapacak. Ayrıca uluslararası ölçekte Fransa'dan Profesör Doktor Rafia Lugayetta tarafından da programa katılım sağlanacak ve biraz sonra da kendisi tarafından bir sunu gerçekleştirilecek program kapsamında. Buradaki öncelikli amacımız veteriner hekimliği yönüyle farklı sistemlerin katılımcılara tanıtılması. Tabii bu etkinliğimiz süreklilik gösterecek ve dolayısıyla mesleğimizin farklı yönlerini içine alacak şekilde zaman içerisinde farklı eğitim programları da planlanacak. Örneğin Balık ekim, su ürünleriyle ilgili, balıkla ilgili uygulamalarda, akvatik canlılarla ilgili uygulamalarda farklı bir eğitim programının oluşturulması, bakanlık ve Türk Veteriner Hekimleri Birliği ile yine farklı bir eğitim programının oluşturulması da yine hedeflerimiz içerisinde. Ben bütün bu düşüncelerle eğitim programının başarıyla tamamlanmasını özellikle temenni ediyorum. Katılım sağlayanlara, program kapsamında sunu yapacak olan uzmanlara, ve projenin planlanmasında ve katkıları nedeniyle de özellikle doçent doktor Begüm Yurdakök Dikmen'e iştenlikle teşekkür ediyorum. Hepinize saygılar sunuyorum. Teşekkür ederim. Sayın Dekanımız, konuşmalarınız için çok teşekkür ederiz. Şimdi e, Profesör Doktor Rafael Gattio tarafından e, sunum gerçekleştirecek. Guateo sunumuna başlamadan önce kendisi hakkında 
kısa bilgi vermek istiyorum. Profesör Doktor Rafael Guatteo 2000 yılında Fransa Nant Üniversitesi'nden mezun oldu. Serbest hekim olarak çalışmaya başladıktan sonra Veteriner Fakültesi'nde Çiftlik Hayvan Sağlığı ve Halk Sağlığı bölümünde öğretim görevlisi olarak göreve başladı. Yüksek lisans tezini etçil uzağlarda solunum sistemi hastalıkları üzerine tamamladıktan sonra doktorasını Q humması epidemiyolojisi üzerine tamamladı. 2007 yılında kıdemde öğretim görevlisi olarak devam etti aynı üniversite içerisinde. Ve 2009 yılında Avrupa Sır Sağlığı Yönetimi Koleji, European College for Bovine Health Management'da board sınavını tamamlayarak diplomatlık ünvanını aldı. Ayrıca Avrupa Hayvan Refahı ve Davranış Tıbbı Koleji'nin başarıyla tamamladı. Profesör Gatte Halen, Nant Üniversitesi Çiftlik Hayvanları Sağlığı Bölümü, Bireysel ve Popülasyon Sığır Tıbbı, Epidemioloji ve Refah konularında çalışmalar yapılan Ruminant Kliniği'nde Büyükbaş Hayvan Sağlığı Yönetimi Profesörü olarak görev yapmaktadır. Profesör Gatte tarafından yapılacak sunum İngilizce olacaktır. Ancak bildiğiniz üzere eğitim programımızdaki diğer tüm dersler Türkçedir. Profesör Guatayo sunum sonunda sorularınızı chat kısmından Türkçe veya söz olarak İngilizce olarak doğrudan iletebileceksiniz. Dear Professor Guatayo, um, please welcome. You can start sharing your screen. Hello. Hello. Thank you for joining our education program and to our opening ceremony. And you can start sharing your screen. Thank yeah. you. Um, I try to find the right button. It's um, on the right side on the bottom page, the purple one. When yeah, you click on I, it, you can start I don't, share. I don't have uh, partager l'application écran. Okay, it should be fine now. Up. Okay. Okay, do All you right. see the slide? Yes, perfect. Okay, thank you, Begum. So thank first you. of all, I would like to... Uh, thank you, Begum. I would like to thank you warmly for your kind invitation and to thank the Ankara Faculty for Veterinary Medicine to give me the opportunity. I'm very proud to, to be in front of you today to, to give you this talk about, uh, the, about the overview of Internet of Things, so monitoring tools basically in ruminants, and to give you, uh, I would say, another view about, in my opinion, what can be considered as opportunities and limits of the use of, of this IoT, Internet of Things, uh, for the health and welfare of, of cattle and especially dairy cattle. So just a few words in introduction, as it was mentioned by Begum, I'm full professor in bovine health management at the veterinary faculty in Nantes in the western part of France. I don't know if you are familiar with the cartoon Asterix and Obelix, which is pretty famous. So it's really close to the to the city of the of the Gaulois, okay? And I'm also pretty involved in the specialization in terms of, of cattle medicine and herd health management through the European College of Bovine Health Management and also through EBVS. So uh, to before going into details about what can we expect and what are the different tools of uh, uh, in terms of connected tools that we can use on on dairy cattle i just would like to remind you what are i would say the main indication for which we can decide to set some equipment uh, either within the cows or around the cows uh, within the barn for instance and so i think in my view that we can consider that we have four main indication for which we can decide to use connected um, tools Rafael, sorry to disrupt you but uh can you make a full screen please because i we're not able to see your slides moving and we're just in your well, first am, slide right uh, now uh, yeah i am can you make, i am can you I make am a full screen? screen i am okay um here I am yeah. in full screen. Oh, all right. Okay. Thank you. Now we can see at your slide three. Okay. Okay, it's good. Now it's good, but I can interrupt you if it doesn't move. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, so yes, in my view, four main indication for which we can decide to to to set some equipment uh, uh, at co level or at barn level. The first one is surveillance and and distraction. I would say so. I give I put here some picture about different animal species and not only dairy cattle because, as you may know, and probably you will have some uh, um, 
presentation in uh, during this uh, training about uh, artificial intelligence and digitalization about the use of IoT also in pets uh, and not only in cattle but for sure one main indication is surveillance and distraction so for cattle it's mainly based on camera surveillance for instance for heat detection or mainly for for dystopia and calving but for sure we have a uh, I would say similar um, uh, tools and, and, and, and methods and, and, and IoT for pets uh, and what we can what we have to bear in mind in that aspect is that it's not always for the health and the well-being of the animal especially for pets uh, it's it's rather for the I would say I don't know if the for the welfare or for the consciousness of the of the owner but we have to bear in mind that normally primarily this IoT should deserve uh, for uh, welfare of, of animals for sure so one main indication is surveillance and distraction Another one is monitoring of animals location, so mainly through GPS system. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that you are familiar with that. And so I would say that we have two different kind of, of big indication in that, uh, in, in, in that aspect of animals location. The first one is trying to preserve instead of poaching for sure wildlife. And in that sense, collecting and, and, and gathering all data in a safe place is for sure a crucial issue. And the second uh, use uh, uh, of this kind of system, for sure, is to trace the animal. Um, okay, uh, but it, Rafael, it's, we're still in the uh, slide three, by the way. So I guess the... So I, the, I don't know how to proceed, Begum, because I am in full screen. I am in presentator mode. Uh, so okay. I don't know how to, to do that. Um, okay, maybe you can retry it. Here, do you see the slide moving or not? Um, right now we're in the slide four, but uh, it doesn't seem like it's uh, slide so, sharing. It's like we can see. Uh, so, it's it not a full so it screen. doesn't work. It's not a full screen. But I am in full screen, so I, I don't understand why it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can exit from full screen and uh, it's going to be the same. Uh, screen for us so we can try it again. I, I, I don't have the option, I just choose the, the... You can start share application screen and not put uh, the uh, share screen button. Okay, now yeah, it's perfect. It fine? Yes, it's now perfect. Okay, so yeah. so okay. now regarding monitoring animals location, okay, so as I told you before, ever first use regarding wildlife, Okay, and then the collection of safe data is really for sure a key issue. And the other possibility is to trace the animal, but for sure it means that by tracing the animal, you will al also trace the owner. So it's a problem once again for pets and not for, for cattle, or at least for ruminants. And But for ruminants, and especially in pastoral system, it can be very useful to know exactly where the animal is first, but it, all, it opened also the possibility of virtual fences, which can be in, in some occasion very useful. And last but not least, we will see that after during the presentation when you have a, um, a system that allow to detect heat and especially heat detection it can be very useful especially in very big herds to know exactly where is the cow in alert in order not to lose time uh, the third main indication regarding the use of IOT is to evaluate and drive animals nutrition okay and once again it's possible both in pets and in, in ruminants and in that case, I, I, I, um, I show you here for sure a picture of an automatic feeding system that you are all familiar with in, in cattle. So for sure, it's something which is very old. Huh? So for sure, IoT seems something very modern, but at least in cattle, we have some, I would say, system that can be considered as IoT, which are already present in the earth for decades now. I would say the main risk regarding this, uh, this, uh, the use of such a system is do we secure animal nutrition or do we create a distance between the farmer and the, and the cattle and then a risk maybe of losing some, I would say, the farmer high perception and farmer high skills in terms of, of health disorders detection, for instance, or, or even monitoring the, the, the herd. 
And last but not least, the last main indication for which we can use to use IoT in animal and especially in terms of animal health is to use uh, the, the data provided by different IoT, for instance, CODA, registering activity in rumination, for instance, so mainly modeling behavioral or physiological parameters, okay? And for this kind of, of device, we need to keep in mind that they are more or less efficient or more or less, I would say, build and initially created for else. Initially, as we can see afterwards in, in the in the following slide, it was mainly created for heat detection initially, and then to use the same parameters to to detect not only uh, heat but also some disease, and it can explain the sometimes the lack of sensitivity and specificity, especially for else disorder detection. And we have also to keep in mind that some of these devices can be invasive uh, in terms of uh, in invasive for the body of the animal. So we have al also to keep in mind that uh, this device uh, uh, needs also to produce some, some data about their safety for the animal. We will see that in, in the end of the presentation. So these are the main indications. So we have um, a surveillance, uh, uh, monitoring uh, nutrition, localization and monitoring behavioral and, and physiological parameters. And all together, especially in ruminants and, and in our case here in cattle, these the tools can be combined together in the frame of what we call PLF for precision, precision livestock farming. Okay, so how does it work? Basically, roughly, you have uh, different uh, tools which are embedded, set it on the animal, for instance, ear tag, pedometer, activimeters, bolus in the rumen, allowing the detection of hypothermia, for instance, and different other possibility, such as, for instance, outside of the co, camera, or even robot milking system. All these tools produce continuously uh, some parameters, such as production, temperature, some behavior, for instance, rumination, if the co is lying or standing. And all this IoT produce data that you need to capture. And it's one of the first limit because when especially the cow are not in the barn, but on the pasture, it can be one of the limitation to capture on real time all the data. And then all the data that are captured are then transferred, I would say to a computer where algorithm continuously compare the observed data. So the data produced by the different IoT, okay? And they are compared with the predictive value, value which are predicted by some algorithm. And this algorithm being mainly based on the data produced by the cow itself in the previous day. So it means that in, in the vast majority of the cases today, all the IoT use as a control the cow itself and not a fixed threshold for every cow. And then we ha you have data inter what is served through the IoT and what could be expected through the different models provided by the algorithm, then you have an information which is sent to the farmers, for instance, on his smartphone, okay? And then the farmer will have to, to take a decision, okay? Either to look at the cow, to examine the cow, or maybe to make an action, for instance, for feeding or even during the, the milking process, for instance, okay? And what you, you have also what to bear in mind that normally, the system send an information to the farmer, but in response, normally the farmer should give feedback to the machine in, in order to increase the deep learning process in the machine to improve the accuracy of the algorithm. But from my experience, from my perspective in France, I will be happy to share your experience in Turkey about this, but usually the farmer are not really very trained about all the possibility and potentiality of all these tools. And usually they receive the information, but they never send back feedback. And that's the main issue when we talk about deep learning. So the action is either directly on the animal, for instance, in a clinical examination, but sometimes it can be also go through robots or, or automats, okay? And so all the question is that we don't need, or at least from a farmer perspective, okay, the goal of all this IoT and of this precision livestock farming system is not to produce data, uh, but help in the decision-making process. So we have always to keep in mind that the main important thing is not to produce data, but to help the farmer and maybe the vet in the decision-making process. So for, to, do, to, to do this, we need absolutely some robust and reliable tools and alerts. Okay, so after these few words of introduction about what are the different indication uh, of the IoT, Internet of Things, and what can be, I would say, the, the frame of PLF, precision livestock farming, 
I will now go into details in the, I will say a sort of panorama overview about the different tools that you can use on your daily basis. So just to give you another view about what is used currently in France, okay, this is what you see on the graph uh, below on the slide. Okay, it was a, a survey you know, conducted uh, towards uh, uh, cattle farmers, dairy cattle farmers, to know what kind of system they used in their farm. So not surprisingly, the three first, oh sorry, it is in French, huh? I don't know the words in, in Turkish, but I will translate you in English. So the first one was DAC, it's a, a automatic feeding system to deliver concentrates, okay? And the two other ones were for the monitoring of heat and the monitoring of calving, okay? So it means that it's really, and, and followed especially by automatic milking system. So it means that the main indication for which the farmer uh, invest in terms of IoT, at least in France, it's for sure reproduction monitoring for both calving and heat detection, and usually it's not the same system, okay? And also automatic feeding or automatic milking system. Here on this picture, I give you another view about what are the different, to the best of my knowledge, what are the, I would say, the different type of, uh, of connected tools, uh, connected devices that you can uh, embed it or set either within the cow, in the cow, or uh, in the barn, okay? And to facilitate the reading of this picture, I put some little circles of different colors uh, that uh, correspond to the main indication that we uh, discussed a few minutes ago. So either I would say a reproduction, feeding system, health, or I would say general monitoring of the herd. And so I will not uh, give, uh, I will not spend too much time on that. I will give details afterwards and you will have access to the presentation afterwards, after the presentation, but maybe we can make a focus on, I don't know, for instance, four or five different IoT. So the first one for which you are probably very familiar with is for instance, ERTAG or COLAR, and uh, that allow the, um, um, identification of variations of activity and also in terms of rumination. And when you observe concomitantly an increase in activity and a decrease in rumination, it's very specific of it, for instance. And you can easily understand that if you have both a decrease in activity and a decrease in rumination, maybe it can be, um, it can lead you to have a suspicion about a health disorder. So these tools, I will say, are really widely distributed around the world. Another system linked also to reproduction are pedometer or activimeters that allow once again to detect the number of steps or the activity of the cow. And once again, you see that these devices were created initially to detect it. And so really reproduction monitoring was really the main focus of a lot of devices at, at the beginning. And for instance, last but not least, some devices can uh, be put either in the vagina of the cow, for instance, to detect variation in terms of temperature, especially uh, uh, to detect the, the modification in, in temperature and hypothermia uh, uh, occurring just before the calving, or you can have some devices put on the tail to detect some movement of the tail, once again, uh, uh, preceding uh, calving, okay? So as you can see, a lot of devices are really focused on either dystocia or calving detection or heat detection. But interestingly, as you can see here around the cows, you are different other system that can be used to detect uh, not only reproduction, I would say, uh, events such as uh, uh, heat and, and calving, but also health disorders. For instance, if you have continuous monitoring of the milk, for instance, to detect lactate deshydrogenase, for instance, to detect mastitis, but you can also have some system within the rumen of the cow, some boluses that could allow to detect either the pH, leading to the suspicion of ruminal acidosis, or to detect hypothermia. It can be very useful, for instance, in young fattening units. So as you can see, plenty of possibilities, either via the camera to, to detect the body condition score of the animal or to detect the live weight, etc. So you, you, you see that there is really plenty of opportunity. I will, I will make a short focus on calving detection and heat detection as to the best of my knowledge, it's really the, the, the, the tools which are the most frequently implemented on, on the field. So if we begin by the IoT for calving detection, I would say that you, you, the, the, the, the idea is to follow the parameters of interest. And if we talk about calving and especially calving detection, what 
is of interest to be followed, uh, you know, to detect calving or even dystocia temperature for sure. We know that there is a slight hypothermia and then a strong hypothermia preceding calving. For sure, behavior modification, such as uh, a lying boots, standing boots, etc., and also contraction, for instance, of the abdominal wall. Okay, then the available IoT were built, I would say, as a consequence and linked to this parameter interest. So probably that in France, the, the, the most uh, uh, frequent tools that we, we have are vaginal temperature measurement system. Okay, this kind of, of tools uh, looking like a spider that to put in the vagina of the cow, allowing to detect the modification of the, uh, of the temperature, leading to detect the, the, the Calvin. I, I give you also here an idea of the price. So if you want both the bases and four system, allowing you to equip five cows, it will cost 3000 euro. But these bases can be reused also to capture the data from other IoT from the, the, the Medria uh, concept. In terms of, of efficacy, in terms of performance of this system, specifically the Velphone, you can see here the results of the survey, which was conducted in 2012 in an experimental farm in the western part of France, both in blue in ethers and green in cows. Okay, and we will uh, uh, especially look at the the two last part of the of the graph. Okay, uh, ATT is. Uh, please be careful. Probably something will happen in the next four to six hours, okay? And X is expected, expected calving, okay? So probably something is going on, okay? And you can see here, the specificity was perfect. And here you have the value of sensitivity, okay? So we can consider as a rule of thumb that for this kind of, of, of IoT, this kind of tools, the performance, especially in terms of sensitivity and specificity are really very good. We talk also about other parameters of, of interest to detect calving, such as, for instance, movement of the tails or abdominal contraction, etc. So as a consequence, you have other devices. Some of them are, are, are less expensive, okay, but can be used only for calving detection and not for other purposes, okay? And then they are put in the tail of the cows and allow the detection of tail movements, okay? So do you have different system on, on the field, on the market, smart VL, MooCall, alert VL, etc. And so ideally, they need to be put on the cow between three and four days before calving. And once again, as you can see here, the sensitivity is really very good and the farmer receive on his smartphone an alert that probably calving is, is, uh, is coming. Okay, you have also other system based on the detection of abdominal contraction. A very famous system, especially in Belgium with blue Belgian, uh, blue Belgian breed is Agromonitor system, okay? And if you want to invest in two belts, it will cost approximately 3,800 euro, okay? And ideally, the cow needs to be fitted within uh, the six hour before calving, okay? But to the best of my knowledge, we don't have information about sensitivity and specificity about these tools, okay? So as you can see, a lot of different possibility, but to the best of my knowledge, these are really this kind of, uh, of tools allowing the detection of temperature modification around calving, which are the most frequent on the field. And then the last question regarding all these kind of IoT is as a vet, if the farmer asks me which tools should I choose, how should I choose, sorry, how can we help him? So we can help him by uh, setting first, asking the farmer, what are your main and second objective, okay? If you want, for instance, improve calving surveillance, what can you consider as a second objective? For instance, is it to detect dystocia? Is it to anticipate calving, so to be informed as early as possible? or to have only reliable alert as soon as the calving starts. So I will say here, the first box, anticipate calving, you need something very sensitive, but you accept some false positive alerts. In the last box here, reliable alert, it means that you look for something very specific, okay? And depending if the farmer, whether or not has already some box for uh, uh, other detection, for instance, heat detection, etc., it will uh, make easier the, the, the, the decision process because it's it, the same thing, for instance, with Apple. If you already have a smartphone from Apple, for instance, it will be easier if you want to, to connect an iPad, uh, if you want to connect uh, uh, your MacBook, etc. Everything is connected because this is the same informatic environment and this is the same for, for different IoT. For instance, if you already have the basis for heat detection of Medria, it will be easier to use the calving detection from the same manufacturer, I will say, because you can use the same basis uh, informatic basis, which is supposed to capture and analyze the data. 
and then you can it can lead you to choose the, the, the existing solution so once again when you want to give advice to the farmer it's very important to know what are the objectives for instance when you want to you when you use a, uh, the belt allowing to to detect uh, abdominal contraction for sure it would not allow you to anticipate calving and then beside the iot for calving detection you have iot for heat detection and here in this specific case the parameters of interest that you would like to follow are activity for instance we know that we have an increase in activity some behavior such as for instance rumination but also maybe the detection of some hormones such as progesterone and then once again as a consequence different iot were developed to look at these parameters so for instance you have uh, trackers allowing to detect the activity of the cows so it can be found either in accelerometers huh, that are fitted in the feet of the animal or in collar that allow to detect the rumination of the of the animal okay you have also some possibility to measure online the progesterone in the milk of the animal it's uh, something for instance which is allowed by using the earth navigator system which is a embedded lab uh, uh, going uh, with um, uh, the laval uh, robot milking system okay something very effective too and as we told you uh, as we were um, saying just before you have also other parameters of interest such as for instance behavior and especially mounting we know that mounting is a very specific sign of uh, for heat detection and so you have different kind of, of system initially very whole system based on on, on capsule with uh, uh, paint uh, inside and then when you have mounting you have some painting either yellow or red on, on the on the feet uh, on the back of the cow sorry but now you have also some connected devices uh, allowing the detection of the pressure of the cow above the other one and then the farmer receive a message on the smartphone to the best of my knowledge it's one of the system which is really very used in the in the uh, grazing and pasture system especially in Ireland and last but not least, you have some uh, works currently about the use of camera uh, combined with artificial intelligence for image analysis to detect some specific behavior, such as once again mounting, allowing to detect uh, heat. So as you can see, plenty of possibility. And after reproduction, because as I told you before, reproduction was really the main and the first reason why they developed IoT, now we are uh, ever using uh, parameters from other object objective than detecting uh, calving and heat and so for sure we can combine differently activity rumination temperature not only to detect calving or heat but also some disorders if you have an increase in hyperthermia if you have a decrease in activity a decrease in rumination it can lead you to suspect the disease but for sure you don't know which one at this stage and in a second step, some manufacturers uh, decided to develop devices not focused at all on reproduction, but 100% focused on S. For instance, some uh, uh, rumen boluses allowing to detect the pH and the temperature. So you see there is a trend, a sort of shift from repro to health. And so what as a vet, uh, uh, is it changing or not in our daily practice? So on, on, on this figure, I try to summarize what is, I will say, the diagnostic approach that we have every day when we are facing a case. You have here a sick cows, okay? And in the first step, you will make a clinical examination as precise and detailed as possible, okay? And you will compare what you've seen with what you know or what you are supposed to know, okay? So basically what is on the book and then you compare you combine to reach a diagnosis or at least a prognosis a progno, a sorry but in some cases you have still have uncertainty because the, cl the clinical examination is pretty vague or you're able to make a full clinical examination because for instance the cow is really very aggressive or she's recumbent and then the examination of the legs is not very easy etc so Whatever the cause, in, in some cases, after the end of the clinical examination, you are not sure about the diagnosis. And then you will use both your experience, but for sure also some complementary or ancillary tests, for instance, blood analysis, or for instance, I don't know, ruminosynthesis to look at pH of the rumen, for instance, 
to, to, to help you in the diagnostic process and especially when you are, when you are dealing with infectious disease or with production disease for which you can expect not only one but a, a huge prevalence of sick cows affected by the same disease in the herd sometimes it can be very useful to make complementary tests to determine the prevalence of the disease within the herd because as you may know uh, sensitivity and specificity are really very important to interpret the results of your of your uh, complementary test but the positive predictive value and the negative predictive value are also very correlated to the prevalence of the disease okay so the highest the prevalence is the highest the positive predictive value is the lowest the, pre the prevalence is the better the negative predictive value will be so it's it can be very useful to determine the prevalence and what we, we will see now in the following slide is how can we consider the IoT, all these connected tools in this diagnostic approach, okay? Is it possible that this IoT will help you, I will say, to, to see more than what you can expect from a basic clinical examination? Is it possible to use them to elaborate a pronostic or maybe some complementary test? And why not to revise the normal range, okay? So one of the interests of this IoT is, in my view, to give you access to new information which were not miserable before. Okay, for instance, activity rumination. Here you have a screenshot about uh, the interface that the farmer will see if this cow are set it with this equipment uh, from SCR, so the sense time uh, solution, sense hub, or the cola. So here it's an ear tag and here uh, a device on the cola, okay. And so these are the kind of curve that you can observe. So here in purple, you have the rumination, okay, in minutes per day. And here in orange, you have the activity, okay. And as you can see here, you have a strong and, and, and very rapid decrease of both activity and rumination. And then you will have an alert here, it's a recubent cow, okay. So for sure, activity and rumination, normally through your clinical examination, it's not possible to have an idea about the activity, especially within the last two or three days. And the same for rumination. What we can measure is uh, uh, the, the, the rhythm of ruminal contraction uh, with uh, the stethoscope for sure, but really the rumination, normally it's something which is not miserable, measurable, sorry, through the clinical exam. So, and by that, by that way, probably that subclinical may become visible and then clinical. Another example of some parameters that were not measurable before and that can not be accessible using this, uh, this IoT, this is typically the ruminal pH, okay? As you may know, we have the three approach, replace, refine, and, and reduce the number of animals for experimental uh, settings, for instance. This is the same uh, to, to, to deal with pain uh, in animals and especially in livestock. And the idea is to suppress, if possible, the source of pain, if not possible, to substitute uh, the painful procedure by a less painful procedure. And if a pain is still existing to through pain using, for instance, NSAID, okay? And so in the in, in this approach, the 3S approach, suppress, substitute, SUS, uh, thoth pain, this kind of IoT are really very useful because you put it in the rumen of the cow and it allow you to continuously monitoring for at least three months the, the, the pH of the rumen. So if you are in, in big herds with a very uh, acidogen uh, uh, feeding system, it can be useful to, to, to monitor uh, subacute ruminal acidosis. And another example, uh, it's uh, uh, especially when you are facing lameness problem in the herd, for sure, gait and mobility scoring are very important to do regularly to detect as early as possible the lame cows, okay? And in that, in that way, some recent developments of pressure mats, of uh, pressure trimming shoot like this one, the cow go through the, the, the system and the system detects the weight that the cow put on each of the legs and then if you have a modification within a cow uh, between days then you will have an alert okay so really different kind of inform sorry different kind of information that were not uh, available before okay this iot give also access to some data which were available before for instance temperature but the temperature was only accessible when you do the clinical examination. You had no clue about the temperature within, for instance, the last 48 hours, okay? And now with this kind of devices, for instance here, a bolus that you can put in the rumen, allowing to detect hypothermia, you can have some curves like this, allowing to detect, and when you compare here, the green curves, which is the predicted temperature, and here the blue one, which is the observed temperature, when you have a huge discrepancy between both, then you have an alert, okay? 
And interestingly, when you look at the uh, temperature of the animal over one day, depending on whether it's uh, measured on the hair canal with a system fitted in the hair of the animal, if you measure the temperature uh, through rectal temperature or within the rumen, you can see here that depending on the time within the day or even on different days here on the, on the on the right of the slide okay day one day two to day five okay you can see that within a day and between day some you have some variation of temperature okay and especially it depends if you want to set a threshold to indicate that there is hypothermia you can't use the same threshold if you measure the temperature via the rectal way or for instance in the rumen so it means that first this IoT could maybe help us to revise what is a normal range of temperature first and second, it should uh, uh, uh, force us to consider that the animal has its own control uh, and maybe it's not a good idea to give the same threshold for everyone regarding hypothermia or rumination for instance, okay, because if you are for instance facing a dish or a plate, you will not all eat at the same speed. This is exactly the same for a cow. What is interesting is does the cow feed uh, either quicker, more uh, in, a, in a more fast way, or contrarily, does it take more time to feed uh, uh, in comparison with what uh, we, you observed every day? So, really, please consider the animal at its as it its own control. And last but not least, this IoT could also open the opportunity to refine anamnesis and give uh, new answers, I will say, to old questions. Uh, a question which is very frequent when you begin a clinical examination is, okay, the cat was sick, but since when? Okay, and here with this kind of IoT, here once again, the example of rumination and activity. And you can see on this animal, okay, here, we were called by the farmer at this stage, so at the end of the curves, okay, and the cow finally was diagnosed with her peritonitis, okay, and for sure when we open the history of rumination and activity, you can see this very, I would say, almost pathognomonic aspect of reticuloperitonitis, you know, with some chronic phases with decrease and increase, okay, up and down in terms of rumination. So it can be very useful to have a clear idea about duration and chronicity. And in the same way also to answer to the question, do you have other cows which are sick or not? Okay, here you have once again a data that you can observe from the uh, the sense uh, time system. Okay, so allowing to detect rumination and activity modification. And here the curve is not based on the curve from one animal, but that's the mean of all the cows that have the system within the barn. Okay, and here you can clearly observe here a decrease. Okay, and if the mean decrease, it means that a lot of cows have a decrease in rumination time. Okay, and here you can observe. Uh, really on real time, huh? you are called for one cow, but you can look at this data in maybe five to 10 seconds and have an idea if, for instance, if you are in a situation of heat stress, for example, if you have a decrease or not of the rumination on the on, on the herd level and not only at co level, okay? You can have also some uh, uh, information regarding especially uh, the location of the animal. Uh, we talked about uh, animation in introduction to have a clear idea about the time budget. Huh? So the time that the cow is supposed to devote every day in uh, looking for food, rumination, resting, okay, uh, standing, etc. So these tools really allow to, uh, to assess more generally, not only else, but time budget and then welfare. Huh? I, I, this is, to my opinion, really the, the last and not least really big interest of this kind of IoT. I don't know the situation in Turkey, but at least in France, in the western part of Europe, there is a huge demand from the citizen, from the consumer, to, to improve the welfare of livestock in general, especially in, in pigs and poultry, but also in cattle with, for instance, access in pasture, etc. But they would like also transparency and to be sure that uh, what is written on, on the product, for instance, uh, milk of cows uh, being in pasture for at least eight months is really true. And this IoT by all the data they produce could really help to facilitate the discussion, I think, between science the livestock industry, the livestock sector, and also the consumer. Okay. And uh, to finish my presentation, I will give you some uh, some aspects uh, relied to the performance of this IoT. Because when we talk about performance, I mean there are two main situations that we want to to avoid. The first one is to have a device that lead 
the too many alerts on LC cows. So it's a lack of specificity. You will have a lot of false positive alerts. And then you have two, two kinds of behavior from the, from the farmer point of view. The first one, the farmer is still confident of the tool, okay? And each time there is an alarm, he, he made something, okay? He, he put in, an action in place, okay? And in some cases, at least in France, it can lead to the overuse of medication and especially antibiotics. And in the context of rational use of antimicrobials, it, it's not something that is desirable. The, uh, the, the second possibility is that the farmer lose his trust in the alert, okay, in the alert or in the alarm, and then do not see or do not treat cows that are really sick, and then for sure it can have a negative impact on the welfare. The other things that we want to avoid is not a lack of specificity, but the lack of sensitivity. So it means that the device will lead on too many sick cows that are not detected. And here we are in the same situation that the previous one. So it means a delay or even no treatment of sick cows, okay? And then a major detrimental impact on welfare. And just to give you an overview, we know that as a rule of thumb, more than 95% of the data provided by automatic system automatic milking system, so robot milking system, are not observed. Huh? I would not, I don't say treated, are not observed by the farmers. So if they don't look at, at, at all this data, it's probably because first they are probably lost within this, uh, I would say this cloud of things with this massive number of, of data. Sure, we can be lost within that for sure, but also maybe they, they lose their trust in, in, in, that, in, in this kind of data, okay. And so it could be, I would say, pretty intuitive, pretty natural to consider that there is a regulation, that there is, for instance, something like the, the, the, the, the process that you need to go through when you want to put, for instance, a vaccine or an antibiotics on the market. You know, it needs to be licensed. Okay, you, you, you need to have a LCP, et cetera, to, to have a good dossier beyond that. If you are in human medicine with similar system, for instance, a Fitbit system for a sick person, uh, I don't know, device to detect, for instance, glucose in the blood, etc. Then you have a frame and a regular uh, a regulation to, to, to, for this, okay? But in, vet in, vet in veterinary medicine, sorry, you have no frame, absolutely no regulation, except for a robot milking system, for which you have normally minimal sensitivity and specificity that are expected, but we know that in practice, it's far from reality. So one of the first question is really that we need for harmonized and robust assessment methods and to test not only efficacy, effectiveness, but also safety, safety for the animal, but also for environment, because a lot of these IoT use also some very scarce metals uh, and are also uh, very, uh, are demanding a lot of energy and that, that, can be, uh, uh, that can be problematic in our context of global warming. A first question regarding efficacy is the, reli the reliability of what you, you, you expect to measure where, uh, using the device, okay? So you need, uh, I, I will say, a correlation between what you are supposed to collect and what is the reality, okay? So for some parameters such as temperature, for instance, here, you have a correlation between the rectal temperature and the rumen temperature. You can see that there is a good trend, so okay, it's fine. And even if there is a delta, it's always the same delta. So you measure the temperature in the rumen, you add or retrieve the delta, and then it's fine. You know that you have a good measure of what could be the rectal temperature, okay? But for other parameters, for instance, rumination, it's not very easy because it means that if you want to compare rumination measured by the collar and the real rumination of the cow, you need to observe the cow for, for instance, 24 hours, and it's not uh, very easily on the practical way. So first, you need to know how the, the system is supposed to measure the, the, the parameters of interest, okay? And then the second very important aspect is to have some data about sensitivity and specificity, okay? And as you may know, sensitivity and specificity are defined by building such a table. So here you have the gold standard, the reference method, allowing to know the true status of the animal, for instance, sick and healthy, pregnant, non-pregnant, for instance. And here you have the device using positive alert or absence of alert, and then you have true positive, false positive, false negative, and true negative, okay? So the first question will be how the alert is determined by the system. Is it a fixed threshold? So the same threshold for everyone, 
for instance, as it can be with a fever alert system, which is a, a here tag that you fit on the here on the co, and then you will have a light when the temperature is above 40 degrees, for instance, but it's a fixed threshold, the same for everyone, or does the animal play as his own control? Okay. Do you have deep learning and artificial intelligence leading to improve continuously the alert, or is it a fixed algorithm? I think it's something important to know. And the other thing is, what is the reference method which was used to determine the true status and then to calculate sensitivity and specificity? Because for reproduction, it's pretty easy, okay? The, the, the device is supposed to detect calving. You have an alert, you look at the cow, the cow is calving or not, and then you can say if it's positive or false positive. But in terms of health disorder detection, it's pretty much co much more complex because what is the reference method to consider that cow is LC or not. So it's not so so easy. So we, we still need some work on that. And just to give you another view about what are the, the trade-offs that you need to find between sensitivity and specificity, I would like to share with you the results of an experimental survey that we conducted in Nantes several years ago. So at that time, we were uh, focusing on the collar, uh, uh, producing alerts, health alerts, based on a diminution of rumination and activity, OK? And we compare two different situations. The first one, when we seated, because we had the raw data, we produce our own algorithm, okay? And we de decided to, I would say, to look at the sensitivity for a, a fixed specificity of 97%, uh, producing uh, not more than two false positive alerts for 100 cows. This is the, the level of false positive alert that we considered as acceptable by the farmer. And you can see that with a, such a specificity, the sensitivity to detect health disorders was only 20%, so really too low. And if we wanted to reach a sensitivity of approximately 80% of the disease, okay, then the specificity was only 51%, leading to produce almost 20 false positive alert per 100 cows per day. Okay. This is due to the fact that the health disorders prevalence was very low, only 8%. So, I mean, if you really look for early detection, the risk is maybe to have a risk of false positive and lead, maybe leading the farmer to lose his trust in, in the device. So you really need to train users, okay, first, and second, to choose if you prefer to, to, to uh, as a priority, to put on the top of the priority sensitivity, sensitivity or specificity. And another question to, to wonder before choosing a, a system or another one is to know which context you will use that. For instance, if we talk about the monitoring of temperature, if we are using temperature in the context of young bulls, it's a very good tool, okay? Whatever you use, either in the rumen, on the ear tag, et cetera, because you have a high prevalence of BRD, so it's very favorable for a good positive predictive value. All the bovine respiratory disorders usually are gathered in time, so in a very short period of time. Approximately above 80 to 90% of health disorders of young bulls are bovine respiratory disorders. And hypothermia is a very reliable and early sign of BRD, okay? So altogether, temperature, young bulls, BRD, it's a perfect cocktail, okay? But if you use exactly the same system, it means allowing temperature modification. In the context of dairy cattle, it's completely different because in dairy cows, you have on a daily basis a very low prevalence of disease first. You have a huge diversity of, of, of health disorders and they are not gathered in time, okay? And we have a lot of disease which are not associated with hypothermia, such as, for instance, metabolic disorders, ket ketosis or milk fever, for instance. And so when, once again, you look at the data we, we, we produce within an experimental trial here, you have in purple the number of, of, of alert produced by the bodies, so 170, and here the number of health disorders detected by the farmer, 88, and you see that the overlap between both is only 23%. So it means that for temperature, to be clear, is very good to detect BRD in young bulls, okay, but absolutely not adapted to the detection of health disorders in dairy cows. So you need to think each device in each context. Uh, a last thing which is very important in, in terms of efficacy is also uh, does it allow or not an earlier detection? So here are the results produced within the study I was showing you just before uh, uh, regarding the use of a collar allowing to detect activity and rumination modification. Here on this graph, you have the delay between the first detection by the farmer and the detection by the IoT. Huh? If you are here, minus three or minus two, it means that the, the tool, the IoT, allowed to detect the mastitis two or three days before the farmer. 
Here it's one, it means that the IoT detect the mastitis one day later than the farmers. And as you can see here, over the 41 cases of mastitis, we had more than 60% of the, of the mastitis which were detected earlier than uh, by the farmer, okay? So er earliness in terms of detection is one of the key of the performance of this kind of IoT, okay? And the last question that we have is, is there a return over investment? Uh, is there a certain ROI? Uh, regarding the, the, the, the this kind of device. So it's not something which is really very studied in the literature. So I just would like to share with you a study that we conducted within our research unit, okay? So we made an estimation only for heat detection system, okay? We were in the following context, a herd of 130 cows with no calving season. Why no calving season? Because then you don't need to, be, to buy one system per cow, okay? When the cow uh, has the heat detected, inseminated, and then in pregnant, you can put his collar and put the collar in, uh, uh, on another cow, okay? And we made the assumption that by uh, using that system, the farmer will move from 40% of heat detection sensitivity to 80%, okay? So a lot of very strong assumption. And in this case, yes, for sure, we had an economic gain of approximately 1,800 euro per year, uh, accounting for the investment for sure, okay? But if we are in the context of smaller herds, usually there is no return over investment. But I, I think in, in Turkey, you have probably bigger earth, so you are probably in, in this kind of situation. But it's not so easy to, to, to, to make a clear economic estimation of this thing. And when we ask to the farmer, something which is very important for them is also the easy, the easiness of the thing to, to reduce the stress, especially regarding head detection. So it's a comfort at, at work and, and it's, it's very important for the farmer. And last but not least, regarding performance, it's also what are the opportunities that are open via the use of this IoT regarding syndromic surveillance, okay? And I would like to share with you the result of a survey that we conducted with one of my colleagues, Aurelia Madouas, in, uh, in, in some years ago. It was some years after the outbreak of blue tongue virus, okay? Because in 2008, I don't know if you are familiar with that, but in France, we were free from BTV, and then we had an outbreak coming from the north. Okay, coming from the Netherlands and then from Belgium. So it means that at that time, in terms of preparedness, we were in a very positive, I would say, situation because we knew that it will come from the north of Europe. And, and in terms of clinical pattern, we were also aware about the clinical signs. Okay, so we were very well prepared to, to detect very, uh, very fast. Huh? Uh, the, the, the, the first clinical case. But afterwards, we realized also that blue tongue virus was associated with premature delivering. So we, we were wondering at that time in 2013, if in 2008, if we were not aware about what's happening in the Netherlands, would have been it possible for us to detect that something was going wrong? maybe not knowing that it was blue tongue virus, but would have been possible for us to know that something was going wrong based on the routine analysis of, of duration of pregnancy, okay? So we collected all the data regarding insemination dates and calving dates of cows, dairy cows in France, okay? And here on this map, you will see the spread of the, of the epidemic, okay, of a BTV uh, over time, okay? So here we are week 31, we are three weeks after the first clinical case, okay? And so each right here you see week four, week five, six, seven, eight. So as you can see for sure, BTV outbreaks was a spreading for sure, not surprisingly. But eight weeks after the first clinical cases in France, we would have been able to detect that something was going wrong only based on the continuous observation of premature calving uh, period, okay, of the, of the duration of the calving period. So the key for that is really to have open data, okay? If we have open data, we have really plenty of opportunity to detect uh, surveillance or to detect uh, emergence, sorry, of new disease, okay? And finally, to conclude about the safety of this disease, well, for instance, I, I give you here the results of, of a study which was conducted for this kind of device, which is the EVET birth monitoring. It's a system that you are supposed to put into the vagina of the cow, which detect pressure uh, with abdominal contraction and uterus contraction, and then lead to, to, to, to an alert on the smartphone of the farmer. And surprisingly, they did not observe uh, the expected difference. They observed more dystocia in the cow fitted with the device 
in comparison with the cow without the device because the device lead to constriction of the, on the vulva in some cows okay so it means that if we want to consider as a whole the performance of iot we need to have information first on efficacy but also on safety okay and then it will be my, my uh, three final slides in practice so to conclude in practice how can we use that i will say to the in my view, you have three different situations. The first one, the data or the alert or the IoT in general initiates the visit, okay? They lead the farmer to call you to make the visit. Then you need to take into account the duration of the alert, the nature of the alert, is it reliable or not, okay? To make what we can call a clinical exam 2.0 because you will able to combine and, and to add to your basic clinical examination some very interesting added values such as activity, rumination, maybe temperature, etc. And also you will be able to estimate the intensity, Hello. chronicity, and also Hello. the existence or not of other seed cows. Okay. The second situation. Okay. The second situation is the data or the alert Hello. accompany the visits. Okay, so help you together Hello. to do the visit. To um, can you close the microphone, please? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So the, the second situation is the data or the alert accompanying the visit. Okay. So then it means that when you are doing the visit, do not hesitate to look at other cows. Okay. Not only the one in alerts, because it will allow you to have early detection in other cows, maybe to look at the prevalence of some disease, and maybe also to have, as it is showed here on the two picture, to select the animal that deserve to pay attention, either from the farmers or from the vet, okay? And the last situation in which the data will be very useful, the data or the alert will help you to follow the visit, maybe to monitor the efficacy of what you put in place with the farmer by looking at uh, the, uh, the rumination, the activity, the temperature curves after you visit. What you can see here is a strong decrease of rumination and activity. Okay, and then uh, probably a treatment was put in place and then you can see an increase in rumination and activity, etc. So makes you pretty confident in terms of recovery. Okay, so it can be really very useful in terms of observance, compliance, recording treatment and class, but not least also telesurveillance. I don't know the situation in Turkey regarding tele telehealth and telemedicine in general, but regarding the COVID-19 pandemic, at least in France, it allowed the possibility really to, to put on the field the possibility of telemedicine, not only in human medicine, but also in veterinary medicine. And this IoT are probably part of this, uh, of this solution of telesurveillance. So to conclude, I would say that this IoT and the clinical approach will lead you probably to improve and to increase to elaborate, to refine your clinical examination, telehealth, telemedicine, a lot of opportunities. For sure to revise maybe the range of what is normal behavior, what is a normal temperature, normal rumination time, etc., and probably uh, open the, the, the door for a lot of better understanding of the needs of the animals. It can lead also to avoid some costly and painful intervention for sure. Also to have in real time the estimation of prevalence, uh, especially uh, to create a, a list of cows deserving uh, attention from the farmer or from the vet. And the next step for sure is to, to integrate really deep learning approach, especially in the algorithm uh, in this IoT. But for that, we need really to have a co-design of these tools, the farmer, the engineers, the vets, etc., and also to train the users to the good use of this system. But nevertheless, you always have to keep in mind what we're talking in introduction, some ethical concern about the, the, the real interest for the welfare of the animal, okay, and, and, and, and, and not to lead to a lack of competency in terms of farming skills uh, by a too big distanciation between the, the animals, the farmer and the vet. I would like once again to thank you for your attention and I will be happy to answer your question if you have any. Okay, thank you very much for this great presentation. Um, if any of the participants would like to ask a question, you can raise your hands. Sorusu katılımı veya katkısı olanlar yine et kaldırarak söz alabilir. Türkçe sorabilirsiniz, İngilizce çevrilecektir. I guess we already have a um, question uh, from the chat section. And it's quite a general question. It says, thank you very much for your informative presentation. I'd like to ask uh, about the recent situation of what, when you compare the use of AI 
meta analysis, big data, data mining, and deep learning applications in veterinary science in Europe versus engineering and the other pure sciences. How do you combine them? So this is actually a very general question and not a um, very specific one. And it's uh, yeah. from a professor in Samsung on the University Pharmacology Toxicology Department, Abdul Rahman. Okay. So, yeah. so uh, well, it's a very big and vast question, but uh, to give uh, some, some, some answer, I think that uh, in some area, for instance, some uh, pharmacology, etc., the use of AI is really um, in progress for sure and you have a, a, a lot of, of, of development, and I would say combined development between uh, engineers, mathematicians, pharmacologists, etc., probably to better predict uh, the pharmacocinetic PKPD approach, etc. So I think it's probably one of the field, at least in veterinary medicine, where EI was firstly implemented, for sure. And then regarding the use of, uh, of EI in the daily work, I think, I don't know situation in Turkey, but in France, we have some initiative, so really a basic one, but at least it's still in press, regarding uh, uh, uh, diagnostic, uh, uh, I would say diagnostic software or diagnostic app that you can have on your smartphone to help you on a daily basis to make some diagnosis in cows or but also in dogs, etc. And at this time, I'm not so sure that there is really deep learning and EI beyond, beyond that. I think it's basic algorithm at the moment, because as I told you before, I think that one of the major issue is that we really need to, to, to build together between engineers and the final users, the vet, and also the, the owner or the farmer together the tool, because if we forget the needs of, of, of uh, one of, the, of, of this person, at the end, probably it will, there will be a misuse. So I think that really one of the key is to, to, to have some really discussion. And, and for instance, at, at my faculty, we are really close to an engineer school. So it's a good opportunity for us to have discussion on this aspect. But from my point of view in veterinary medicine, we are really at the, at the beginning of the process. And that's very good that you have an opportunity to speak with the engineers in your faculty. Yeah. And, uh, so what about, before moving to the second question, what do you think about the ownership of the data? The ownership of the data should be the, on the farmers or should be on the uh, company who is providing it and or yeah. should be, as you mentioned, an open source that it should yeah. be always by everyone. Yeah, yeah. I would say from a researcher and academic point of view, from open data is a key for sure, but I know that in real life it's not the cases. So uh, I would say the European uh, perspective in terms of that is not really very clear, but the trend is the following, okay? Whatever the type of contract which is signed between the farmer and the company, the farmer is always uh, uh, uh, able to uh, make what he wants about the data. So for sure he is the owner on the data and he can give the authorization to any kind of person he wants to give access to the data. So for instance, the vets, okay? Sometimes it's not really for free because you just need to pay a very small fee, for instance, I don't know, 10 euro per month to have the informative codes, etc. But normally the trend is that one, the farmer is owner of the data. The company also can put together all the data, etc. But the idea is not to that the farmer pay twice because the farmer pay once by buying the equipment. And then if there is an added value, which is produced by gathering and collecting all the individual data. The idea is not to, to, to, to make pay to the farmer the added value that he, he contributes to produce. You know, you know the thing? So I think the idea is really to the, there is a contract. So for sure, the company can be uh, uh, one of the owner of the data, but the farmer is owner of his own data and he can share the data with who he wants. Okay. The, the, the main problem into that is the place of the vet because the vet usually is not very aware about all this contract thing. And at least in France, the, the first feeling of the vet is, I, I, it's not possible to have access to the data. But at least in France, the farmer is, uh, can give access to the data to his vet. Just a technical issue, but very easy to fix. Do you think that the companies might sell this information to the third parties? If like, let's say a feed company or another company would it be an issue of concern? <laughs> yeah, uh, probably they do, 
but uh, in sometimes it's pretty easy to do that because the company who, who, who sell the product on the field is already connected in some way with the feeding company in a most bigger system. You know, for instance, in PET, uh, I don't know if you are familiar with that project which is launched in the US, which is the whistle, pro the whistle project. It's a collar, okay, which is supposed to detect activity in the dog, okay? And so it was launched by Mars Pet Care, which is one of the biggest company in the world, okay? But uh, the, the, the Bonfield Hospital, which is a big chain of veterinary clinical practice, belongs to Mars Pet Care. So Mars Pet Care decided to put for free some devices in all the different clinics they have uh, in the United States and in North America. But they also uh, have uh, Royal Canin, which is a pet food company and they have also uh, a, a genomic company so they have i would say all in one okay you you you have you are a paid owner you go in bonfield hospital they make a genomic analysis leading to suspect all the the disease for which the the dog is maybe predisposed you know and then you have the good advice in terms of nutrition in terms of follow-up etc and everything belong to mars pet care so i mean yeah. it's a okay. it's a whole in one huh? okay but we normally, if the, yeah. Sorry. Um, but sorry normally, if wait, no, no problem, no, no. And and last, normally, when the farmer signed the contract, normally it should be stipulated within that what could be the the use of the data from the company point of view. Okay, so if normally the use of the data goes beyond because he has a demand from another company, etc. Normally, at least he should give the perm he should ask for permission to the farmers normally. And we got another question, uh, another yeah. pharmacology uh, professor is asking about, may you inform us about the accessibil uh, acceptability of the presented pieces of equipment and the relation between animal welfare? So these equipments, do you think that it's causing a stress on the animals? What about the uh, welfare issues related to these equipment? Yeah. And I also can add another one that you mentioned about the devices that you're putting in the vulva and they have plastic pieces and so on. What do you think about the endocrine disruptors or the plasticizers that are very fastly absorbed uh, through the yeah, mucosal yeah. system? Yeah, so uh, two, two really good, very good question regarding the first one, regarding the welfare impact. Uh, interestingly, uh, when we discuss with a non-governmental organization promoting welfare, they are not necessarily very enthusiastic regarding this IoT, uh, even if it can produce early detection and maybe better understanding of the animal, they are more comfortable with devices at barn level, such as, for instance, camera rather than device within the cow. So I think that currently the, the trend and the shift is probably to move from uh, within cow equipment to outside of the cow and maybe more at barn level than rather on the animal. So this is for sure. Uh, first point and regarding the second point, uh, because regarding the stress, if it's just a coda or a pedometer, there is absolutely no stress at all. But for sure, if you need to administrate uh, the, the, the rumen in the, bo the bolus in the rumen, so for sure, the procedure is a bit invasive, but not, not so much. And regarding the impact of plastic things put into the vagina in terms of, of neuroendocrine perturbation. I, I have no clue about this. I think the question is really very good, but I, I, I don't know if such a study were performed in the past. The only thing I can tell you is that in the herds, uh, at least in France, in the western part of France, which is very familiar to me, in the herds using this kind of system, we don't see any data suggesting uh, uh, uh, a decrease in terms of fertility in cows. That's mm -hmm. the only thing I, I can tell you. And we got another uh, comment from Hannover University uh, from okay. Dr. Kalashidja. Uh, he mentions that EU has already prepared new regulations for sampling of big data from European farmers. So um, I guess the preparations of the regulations are already on the head. And that's what he is mentioning right now. Do you have yeah. any uh, comments on that? No, to the, I think that it's a, it's a very long process at the EU level when you have to, to have a contract, especially when you touch to data. Uh, we had already a big deal in the past year regarding RGPD uh, with the uh, GPDR. 
with the general regulation on, on personal data, it was already a mess. And, and so here, when we touch to to to, to farmers and data, etc., it's even a bit longer. So. I know that the things are in process at the EU level, but we still don't have, I would say, a, a, a final position on that. But in every country, at least in France, we had some, I would say, uh, uh, institutional statement from stakeholders and especially from farmer organization to really go in the direction that I, I, I, uh, I present to you uh, some minutes ago. Okay. And another one uh, from Professor Meruchaj. Is saying thank you for your talk. I have three brief questions. First, yeah. can we say that when the productivity, like milk or egg, of any animal increases, the trend of IoT also increases? And secondly, is the price of the I okay? We can just uh, go ahead one by one. So the first question. Okay, the first question. Uh, uh, normally, I would say the the the more the I think the rate of uh, devices present in the herd is clearly linked to the size of the herd and to the production of the herds, for sure. The, the, the more you want to produce, the more cows you have, for sure IoT can be very helpful. Afterwards, it depends on the number of IoT and the type of IoT, IoT we are talking about, because we have also some farmers in organic farms, maybe only with 50 to 60 cows, which are also happy to have some IoT to detect heat, especially heat detection. So I would say if you really want to go to a very uh, big number of different devices, automatic milking system, cameras, et cetera, et cetera, probably it will be linked to the production level and the number of cows. But for basic IoT, such as heat detection, I think it concerns uh, any kind of farmers. Right, and we got in the second question. Um, yeah. Is the price of the IoT found affordable for the vast majority of animal owners, especially those who use the system actively? So yeah. you mentioned about some cost effectivity. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think about yeah. really worth it? Yeah, yeah, yeah but, uh, but profit. Interestingly, uh, uh, the, the only study that we conducted in France is the one I showed you in the slide, you know, so we made a simulation about uh, a, a certain rate of equipment, a certain rate in increase on, of sensitivity for heat uh, after uh, putting the devices on the cows and it lead to uh, some benefit. But in other situations, because very frequently what we observe, this is usually the farmer with already very good performance in heat detection that choose IoT, okay? But uh, when we ask to the farmer, uh, do you think that uh, it's uh, cost effective or not? The vast majority of the farmer, I'm pretty sure that it's not, but I will not come back because it's, it's too much comfortable for me. It reduces my stress, my workload, my mental load, especially when I need to call the inseminators to inseminate the cow, etc. So a lot of farmers probably consider that if they look into details, it's probably not cost effective. Okay, probably they, they, don't, uh, they don't earn money with that, but they, they, they, will, not, uh, yeah, they will not change. It's, it's too much comfortable. I think this is exactly the same for us with the smartphone. Do you have any idea about what it costs? Is it really effective? But are you able to live without your smartphone today? Mm -hmm. yeah, all right. And finally, the level of popularity of the uh, new systems IoT preferences across the world or EU in particular. So, preference IoT preference across the world. I think uh, the uh, I think you mean in in terms of type of IoT. Probably has mentioned about that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah if it's uh, the type of IoT, I, I would say that heat detection is a. Uh, is probably number one because historically it was the, the main reason why we, we use such a system for sure. And I think that the, the trend currently is uh, the in terms of popularity, at least for research, but not so far from the field, are really uh, uh, image analysis through camera surveillance. All right. And, and in addition to that, also very popular things, especially linked to global warming, and I think in Turkey you are probably even more concerned than us, are uh, what we call a smart barn, 
to have some indicators within the barn to, to monitor uh, humidity, ventilation, etc., and to adapt, I would say, the, the, the, the barn to the, to the meteorological condition, yes. Very popular, too. That's also a very important issue. And how about the objectification of the animals? That's uh, one of the major ethical issues that are being discussed. Do you think that when we're using the system, when we're generalizing the system, do you think that we are objectifying the animal and we're not you mean, defining that you animal mean, anymore but as an object itself? Ah, okay. So it's more an ethical issue about uh, what is the status of the animal, I would say. <laughs> okay. I think the, the, the, the question is interesting. In terms of identification, I think there is plenty of opportunity, both in terms of health and also in terms of ethics, because especially in livestock, when you are facing a, a huge number of cows and even more in pigs and even more in poultry, usually some person, and it's probably one of the main uh, arguments for the non-governmental non organization to try to tackle big herds, you know, and big farming, is to say, okay, it's not human, you don't know the animal, uh, each animal, etc. And I think at the opposite to me, this IoT opened the possibility to reconsider and to re-give an importance to each individual because then it will give you a sort of list of the animal that deserve attention. So I think it can improve or increase the link between the farmer and the precise knowledge of the different behavior of, the, of this animal. But in the same way, we have also to, to keep into account that if we try to, if the data are not used in, in the good way, probably it will lead to decrease the variability because then the, the company or even the farmer or even the vet can consider this animal, okay, this animal is outside from the range, expected range, then culling or just kick, uh, kick it out from the farm. And no, I, I think the idea is more to accept the variability of individuals and probably to, to, to, to re-give birth to the animal through the IoT. And the second question, uh, which is maybe in that uh, regarding the, the ethics, I think uh, I don't know the situation in Turkey, but at least in France, there was a, there is a recent modification of the law and the, the, the animal is really recognized as a, a sensitive, uh, uh, not person, a sensitive being, okay? So normally uh, I would say that the, the main question is in terms of IoT, because the animal cannot decide itself if he wants to be fitted or not with the device, who is supposed to give his, I would say, opinion or his yes or no, go, no go, uh, for these kind of things. And we consider, at least this is my perception, that it could be good to have an external uh, advisor to decide if whether or not uh, the cow will, will really benefit from being fitted or not. And if so, uh, if the cow, for instance, has already, I don't know, a collar, for instance, and a hair tag, is it really acceptable to add uh, still another things, et cetera? So external advice or external uh, assessment for me uh, could, be, could be worth of interest. Okay. Another question um, yeah? from Nalcon. Thank you for the information. My question is, is the mastitis sensor integrated to milking parlor system or just to take the milk and put the sensor-based device. Thank you. Yes, regarding the mastitis, uh, to the best of my knowledge, that um, this is mainly uh, for a robot milking system. And then you can have different kind of information. You can have the temperature of the milk. You can have infrared thermography. You can have pH measurement on the milk and still online uh, when the cow is milked. Okay, but more interestingly, you can have conductivity. Uh, so it's a difference between quarters uh, within other and between uh, between milkings, okay? And you have also somatic cell counts, for instance, for sure. And uh, in uh, the Earth Navigator system, uh, you have also the detection of lactate deshydrogenase, which is pretty good indicators of mastitis. So it's mainly device analyzing the milk itself and mainly through automatic milking system. Okay, and last question we have. Um, yeah. Final comment from Ömer Uçar, he's saying for sure the heat detection and predict the calving time correctly, we would also advise the system all to use. Also the adverse effect of heat stress on the farm 
would also be monitored by the IoT effectively, especially during yeah. indoor intensive uh, production. Yeah, exactly, and and, and uh, yes, for sure, absolutely. Uh, yeah, totally agree, and the, and and it was, yeah, for sure. If you follow very precisely either the activity or the rumination or even better the temperature for sure you will be able to detect very earlier some uh, uh, some modification on the, on the animal and then to avoid as much as possible the negative impact of uh, of its stress so yes for sure this iot open uh, plenty of opportunity uh, to to yes to i will say to both uh, monitor and control at at cow level and at barn level and ideally by combining both. Okay. Well, um, another question from Karai Tekin. How, yeah. PLF, how PLF would change the current veterinary practice? And do you think with this technology, the global warming could be reversed by measuring the effectiveness of the current production system, such as methane production, the role of soil on feedlot versus grazing? Yeah, yeah. Well, in, yeah, in terms of PLF and impact on veterinary practice, I think it's probably because I'm a bit, uh, in, the, in, in my daily life, I'm very optimistic. So I always see the positive aspects before the negative one. But I think it's really a, a good opportunity. Once again, I don't know the precise situation in Turkey, but at least in France, the farmer called the vet very late, only when the cow is really very, very sick. And usually you don't have a lot of things to do then, and it's pretty discouraging. And I think it's really a good opportunity to really go into what we can call as herd health monitoring. But then it means that the, far, the, the vets need to be trained to the different IoT, to different computer system, etc. The farmer also, because the farmer usually has a lot of very kind and refined system, but a lot in a lot of situations he has no clue about how it works ready. And so it's a good opportunity for both the vets and the farmer to teach together. Ah, to yes. So, and it's also a very good opportunity to, to move from, uh, I would say, firework, you know, uh, in emergency to prevention and tele-surveillance, okay? So to look regularly at all the key performance indicators, maybe production, uh, lameness mobility scoring, etc. a lot of different things. And, and, to, and it's a sort also of introduction for answering the second part of the question. I would say in terms of helping to solve the issue that we are facing in terms of global warming, but I would say also rational use of antimicrobials, welfare, etc., all the things for which we can be tackled by the society. I think this IoT are a good opportunity for the vet and the farmer to do in a better way in their daily practice, okay, for sure, but also a good opportunity for the industry to let the people know how it really works in the in the in the in the farms, you know, because the for instance, in France, we had, a, so for you, it's, it's a small herd, you know, but in France, we had in the north of France, a project of establishing a, a, a farm with 1,000 cow that we, do, we don't have such a farm in France. I know that it's pretty familiar for you, but for us, it will be a massive uh, change, okay? And I had the opportunity to visit the farm at the time they had already 700 cows. And from the, the, the society point of view, there was really a lot of attacks in terms of welfare, it's not normal, etc. But when you look at the cow, the cow were really in a very positive state, really the, the, the barn was really fine, etc. And if the person do not want to believe us, at least they can they can look at the data, they can look at the camera, maybe on real time, etc. And really to have open farms, and then they will be able to see exactly what are the good work because in my opinion most of the farm very well and the vets too and then to to to be com completely transparent with the consumer to say okay the the milk you you you drink and the the the, the meat you eat is produced in such a way and and and, and these iot are here to certify that's perfect to get more transparency on that and hope yeah. in the future all these devices will be of battery free with more environmental friendly and at the current state it's uh, not yeah. so much well um thank you very much for joining us and thank you very much for all this uh, good presentation and all the questions related to that and yeah. uh if there is no uh, question i'd like to conclude the session today and uh once again wishing you all the best
Okay, thank you, Raphael. Yeah, thank you. Thank you once again for your kind invitation. It was really a pleasure. Thank okay. you. Değerli katılımcılarımız katılımınız için çok teşekkür ederiz. Sizlere katılım linkleri yani yarınki dersler için katılım linklerini e-posta yoluyla iletmiştik. Derslere bu katılım linklerinden girebilirsiniz. Tekrardan herkese iyi çalışmalar ve iyi günler diliyorum.